Amen. So Ezekiel chapter 27. So we're looking here at a story in the Bible. Ezekiel, of course, is a prophet um, of Judah during the fall of Judah. During the, He lived through the Babylonian captivity in the southern kingdom of Judah. But here he's not talking about Judah. Here Ezekiel is talking about a city to the north, a city called Tyre. So before we get into the sermon this morning, a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago, um, we had a sermon called, Who Holds You Up? Well, this morning I want to give you a sermon called, Who Made You? Who made you? And I don't mean by who physically made you. I mean, who made you? Who put you where you are today? So in Ezekiel chapter 27, we're actually looking, we're going to look at the, at the center part of this story, but basically Ezekiel chapter 27 and Ezekiel chapter 26, and then in Ezekiel chapter 28, Ezekiel, the Bible, God here is telling us about the judgment of this great city, about this city called Tyre that is going to be judged. And in the center of Verse uh, chapter number 27, we see, you know, this great description of what Tyre is and what Tyre has and where Tyre is getting all of its blessings. Look down at Ezekiel chapter 27 and look at verse 16. So let's look at Tyre, which by all means, reading this, this chapter that Brother Ryan just read, we, could, we can assume that Tyre is a greatly blessed city, a greatly blessed city. Look at verse number 16. The Bible says, and I'll just read some of it. We're not going to reread the whole chapter, but just to make the point, let me start in verse 16, where the Bible says, Syria was thy merchant by reason of the multitude of the wares of thy making. They occupied in thy fairs with emeralds, purple, and broidered work, and fine linen, and coral, and agate. So this is talking here about, you know, things, the wares, the things that you wear. They're getting all these, and these just aren't, you know, uh, potato sacks that they're talking about here, you'll, you'll notice it, it talks about blue clothing and purple clothing. These are expensive items, you know, getting those types of colors of, you know, um, clothing and broidered clothing with, you know, these purple and these emeralds. It's obviously fine linen. This is expensive stuff. Look at verse 17. Judah, and it's, so it's talking about all these places that send Tyre, all these blessings. Look at verse 17. Judah and the land of Israel, they were thy merchants. They traded in thy market wheat of minneth and panning and honey and oil and balm. So they're saying here that, that Judah, now what came from Judah was food. And they gave Judah, you know, Judah was farmland. They gave food to Tyre, which is ironic because one of the reasons that Tyre is being judged is because of their treatment of Judah during the captivity. Look at verse 18. Damascus, now we're talking about Syria, was thy merchant in the multitude of the wares of thy making for the multitude of all riches in the wine of Helbon and white wool. Dan also and Javan going to and fro occupied thy fairs. Bright iron, cassia, and calamus were in thy market. Dedan was thy merchant in the precious clothes for chariots. So here we're talking about things like you know, building materials and medicines, calamus that were in the market came from all these different places. Verse 21, Arabia and the princes of Kedar. The Bible says they occupied thee in lambs and rams and goats, and these were they thy merchants. So they even got livestock from, you know, they even got livestock from all these different places. They, they've shipped in everything. Look at verse 22. The merchants of Sheba and Rama, they were thy merchants. They occupied in thy fairs with chief of all spices, with all precious stones and gold. Haran and Cana and Eden, the merchants of Sheba, Asher and Chomad, were thy merchants. These were thy merchants in all sorts of things, in blue clothes, and broidered work, and in chests of rich apparel, bound with cords and made of cedar among thy merchandise. So we're not talking about just things that that sustain them, like food and, you know, your basic staples of life. We're talking about all these luxuries. You know, we talked about luxuries, things that you don't really need, but if you have extra money, you can get these luxury items. You know, nobody really needs, you know, when I go to go shopping, you know, I, I don't really need diamonds. I don't really need rubies. I don't really need pearls. I don't really need these things. These are things that you buy when things are going well. You know, when you have extra money left over. Verse number 25. The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in thy market, and thou wast replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the sea. So not only is this a country blessed, but you see all these merchants from all these different places, they love this city. 
Why? Why do they love the city? Because they're selling all their stuff to this city that's just consuming all these items. So the, the ships of Tarshish, Tarshish is way to the west, um, that comes across the Mediterranean Sea to Tyre. Tyre was this city on the coast. And, the, you know, they're saying that the ships, they love these people. They love them. I mean, the ships, the merchandise, I mean, it's similar, turn to Revelation chapter 18, it's very similar to the city of Babylon in Revelation. It's a very similar situation. Look at verse number 10 of Revelation chapter 18, the last book in your Bible. Revelation chapter 18. So we see it's a very blessed nation. Look at verse 10 of Revelation 18. Standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So here we see that this city is also being judged in Revelation. And the merchants of all the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Now, do they weep and mourn? So it's important to know that, that all these people praised Tyrus. They praised Tyrus. Why? Because they were able to sell stuff to Tyrus. And similarly, in Babylon, we see that, you know, this is kind of a shallow love they have for these cities. These merchants have kind of a shallow love for these cities. And it says, look, the merchants shall weep and mourn over her. Well, oh, you know, that's nice. They're sad. I mean, this city is being destroyed in one hour. They're sad for these people. No, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. They're only sad because, like, who are we going to sell our stuff to? You know, they're destroyed our, you know, they're saying our businesses are destroyed. Our livelihoods are destroyed. Verse 12, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk. Sounds familiar, right? And scarlet and thion wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts, livestock, and sheep and horses, chariots and slaves and the souls of men. That doesn't sound good. That the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things, that means the people selling these things, which were made rich by her. So that's why the merchants love Tyrus. That's why the merchants love Babylon, shall stand afar off, for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they shall cast dust on their heads and cried weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all the ships in the sea by reasons of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Basically a very similar story with Revelation 18 and the city of Babylon. All these ships, all these merchants just bringing all these wonderful items to Tyrus and to Babylon and the merchants were just you know, they're distraught because they're not going to be able to sell anything anymore. All these things, by the way, that nobody really needs. All these things that were just luxury items and things that, you know, are just great over blessings that you don't, just luxuries is, is what these things were. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 27. So you say, you know, Tyrus is going to be destroyed. Tyrus, who has all these things, this city who is just greatly blessed, has all these you know, wonderful, you know, luxuries that they're enjoying, they're going to be destroyed. But the question is, why? Why are they going to be destroyed? Look at verse number 27 of Ezekiel 27. The Bible says, Thy riches and thy fares, thy merchandise and thy mariners and thy pilots, thy hawkers, the occupiers of thy merchandise, all thy men of war that are in thee and in thy company which is in the midst of thee shall fall into the midst of the seas in the day of ruin. So God here is saying that all these things are going to be destroyed in the sea. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. But the question is, what have they done? What did they do to deserve this? Why would God destroy them? Look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says this, Son of man, 
Say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because, well here we go, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am God. I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man, and not God, though thine set thine heart as the heart of God. So this is the main problem right here. Okay, there was a lot of actions that Tyrus, and you'll notice that when God judges, let me just go off for a second, when God judges somebody in the Old Testament, you know, he does a complete job. That's why you can, you can say when you're out soul winning and you're giving somebody the gospel that, hey, God is the perfect judge. God doesn't miss anybody. So the backstory here is that when Judah gets taken into captivity, you know, Tyrus takes advantage of Judah. They, you know, and God does that. When God judges his own people, he then goes back and he also judges any nation that took advantage of that situation. You will find that throughout the, the entire Bible. You will find God is a complete judge. So he will also judge nations that take advantage of you know, his people during their time of judgment. And that's exactly what's happening here. But the main point and the main problem with this king of Tyrus was that he claimed to be God. And he put himself in the place of God. Now Ezekiel 28, of course, is a great parallel passage comparing the king of Tyrus to Satan himself. And we're not going to get into that, but basically this is Satan's problem is Satan wants, Satan wants to declare himself as the Most High, the Bible says. And that's what the king of Tyrus did. That's why it's a great parallel passage. You know, the Ezekiel 28 goes into some, some statements and things that it, it, it must only be talking about Satan, but it applies to the king of Tyrus, which is why it's a great parallel prophecy here. So look, his heart was lifted up so much now, I mean, I think that we all get prideful in our lives, but I don't, hopefully you don't get so prideful in your life that you put yourself in the place of God. That would be, but that's where this guy was. That's where this guy was. And God is going to bring him down and throw him into the sea, the Bible says. He's going to destroy this, this man's city. He's lifted up through blessings. They were lifted up by their blessings. Now, look, this is a common pattern. Aside from the king of Tyrus, if we just look at the pattern of his city, the pattern of a nation, this is a common pattern throughout history of prosperous nations. It's not just Tyrus and not just Babylon in Revelation. This is what happens to nations. This is what happens. I mean, the U.S. today, I mean, if you don't look at this story in Ezekiel chapter 26, 27, and 28 and see the United States, you're not, I mean, you're not opening your eyes. If you don't read, you know, Revelation 18 and see the similarities of the United States, you're, I mean, you're not, you're, not, you're not opening your eyes when you're reading the Bible. I mean, you think about the United States today. How many of you have ever been on the Gulf of Mexico? If you're ever on the Gulf of Mexico, all you will see from the southern coast of Texas, you will just see ships. You will just see large ships coming in. I mean, all the way through the horizon. It looks like, at night, it looks like a city. There's so many ships coming in. And as you go out 30, 40, 50 miles into the Gulf of Mexico, you, it's just ship after ship after ship. San Francisco is the same way. You've ever been to San Francisco and you ever stood on the Golden Gate Bridge? What's coming under the bridge constantly? Ship after cargo ship after cargo ship after cargo ship. I mean, this is us. What are they bringing? Blue clothes, precious stones, timber, Mercedes Benz. BMWs, that's what they're bringing. They're bringing all these things that they're just luxuries. They're luxuries. And, and on the other side of that, as far as the merchants, when, when I'm reading this, as far as the merchants, we went to um, a couple mission trips uh, a, a couple years ago for, for two consecutive years, and we went into the, the Manila Bay. And we were out on a, a cruise on Manila Bay, and what do you see? You see cargo ships. But they're not... They're not coming. They're leaving. The cargo ships are leaving. Where are they going? They're coming here is where they're coming. These are the merchants that are sending. I mean, this is happening today. This is the exact same thing that is happening today. So what, I mean, what the question is, what can we learn from all this? And I've said this before. I'll, I'll say it again. Every national example, every example of a nation in the Bible can be applied to us personally. I mean, we can not only learn from it 
as our nation, but look, we can learn from it personally in our lives. It can be applied directly to our lives. So this is what we're going to be doing this morning. We're going to be talking about, you know, blessings this morning. And where did your blessings come from? Who made you? Who made you? Who gave you what you have? And you're like, I already know the answer to that. Well, let's just dig into it and figure out why when we receive blessings, there's so many troubles, there's so many problems that, that are caused. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is this. The first lesson about your blessings and, and things, that, things that you receive as blessings in your life to remember, and, and when you read Ezekiel chapter 27, you must remember this. Because look, all these things, all these things that said, you know, they're gone in the day of destruction. In the day. In Revelation chapter 18, it was one hour that all these things were gone in one day, in one hour. The first thing that you need to realize is that blessings come and blessings go. That is the first thing that you need to realize in your life. Look, this year, this past year, I'm sorry, last year, from my understanding, was a pretty good one for most of you. Was a pretty good year for most of you. But, but look, we must keep in mind that they, those blessings can go as fast as they came. Think, uh, I want you to think about this for a minute. I want you to think about this morning. All of you that had a great year in 2020, if you didn't have a great year, uh, you know, just still listen. But look, in 2020, if you had a great year, think of the fragility of that success. And most of you, if you have a business or you're, you're running this, I mean, you know that, you know, success is fragile. You know, or, you know, just think of all the things that had to go right for that success to take place. I mean, look, people needed to recognize your efforts, maybe. If you had efforts that paid off, somebody had to recognize those efforts. You know, or not. I mean, you don't think there's people out there? You don't think it's easy for people to not recognize your efforts? There, there's a majority of people out there that love just taking credit for everybody else's effort. Why did someone recognize yours? So maybe somebody recognized your effort in 2020. You know, they easily could have taken credit for it and not given you any recognition. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. It's almost normal today for people to take credit for, you know, pe some people don't have any ideas. Some people aren't good at their job. So, you know, you get somebody who feels like they can take something for their own, they're going to do it. Many people. So, I mean, you think about the fragility of your success. Look, somebody recognized your effort. Somebody was there. I mean, look, Daniel was somebody who was really good at, you know, giving credit where credit was due. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But think about, you know, think about a business. Think about sales. Couldn't sales just not turn out the way that you want them to turn out? I mean, couldn't, couldn't uh, think of, you know, a business thriving. Think about all the things that need to go right for a business to actually thrive. Think about the merchants. But you're like, oh, you're sitting in the pew this morning, you're sitting in the chairs this morning, and you're like, ah, but I have great ideas. I just have great ideas. First of all, I mean, that, that's another one in itself. Where did your ideas come from? And, but uh, an idea has a million unforeseen things that can make it not a good idea. You can have a lot of ideas. I mean, think about it. I've had a lot of ideas, but those ideas don't turn out because of maybe things like cost or things like maintenance or things like, you know, it would just take too long to build that idea or things like, you know, there's a, here's a great idea. I actually had a patent on something one time and it just, there was just no market for it. Look, it takes, it takes a lot more. And I've said this to people who have asked me um, questions on, on ideas and maybe I could get a patent on this or maybe, look, it takes a lot more than just a good idea. A lot more than just a good idea. I mean, what if it doesn't perform like you think it will? This is where math comes in, kids. What if the performance of your idea is just not what you thought it would be because you didn't think of something? Look, the point is there's all sorts of risks and unknowns with ideas. All sorts. It takes more than just a good idea to be successful. Much more. So the first lesson this morning is that success, that all these blessings are very fragile. Realize that they can come and that they can go. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. God will use others to bless you. 
Remember that. Notice, notice this morning how nothing, how nothing came from Tyre. I mean, nothing came from there. It was just talking about all the places that Tyre bought things from. I mean, don't you think that that's important? Look, that makes, that makes those blessings even more fickle. For, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, they're not as sustainable. If you're getting everything from somewhere else, those blessings are not as sustainable. It's that simple. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 26. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 26. If you have nothing, if you do, if, if your blessings don't come from yourself or people close to you, look, it, they're easier to take away. They're easier to lose. Look at Ezekiel chapter 26 in verse number... Um, first of all, verse number 7 talks about how they're going to be invaded by Babylon. We won't read that. But look at verse number 12. Look what the Bible says that's going to happen with these riches. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise. And they shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. Now the beauty of this verse right here is that what actually happened to Tyre, Tyre had two parts of it. Tyre had a, a coastal city, and then Tyre had an island that was about two miles offshore. And Babylon laid siege to Tyre, and they took the city, but they couldn't take the island. They just, it was too well. It had walls that were 150 feet tall, and they couldn't break through. They couldn't get, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar spent years trying to siege this island city of Tyre, and he couldn't break through. But Alexander the Great did. And you know what he did? He laid, he took the dust of the city. Sound familiar? 250 years after verse 12. Do you, you hear what I said? 250 years after God said this in verse 12, Alexander the Great took the dust of the city and the ruins of the city and he laid it in the water. And he built a land bridge to the island and he besieged the island. He, he took his navy and he blockaded the island so they couldn't get supplies and he took the island that way. By taking what Ezekiel chapter 12 prophesied and, he, and now go, you do a, do a satellite view of Tyrus. And what you will see is a peninsula. It is still like that today. So that's a, a great prophecy in the Bible right here. But the point is, God's judgment is complete. And he wipes the floor completely. God's the perfect judge. And look, it's never a good thing when all your blessings come from somewhere else. You say, why? You know, number one, like I said, it's fragile. It's fragile. But number two is, a nation that cannot provide for itself is like a man that can't provide for his family. A nation that can't provide for itself. Look, if I want to destroy you as a man, you know what I'd do? If I hated you, if I hated you and I wanted to destroy you, you know what I would do? This is just me. If I wanted to completely ruin you, I, I wouldn't kill you. I would give you everything for free. I would give you all these things and make you appreciate nothing. That would not only ruin you, but it would ruin future generations of your family. Look at sections of our society today that have been ruined for generations because of this very thing. But look, if you get everything from everywhere else, that's an extreme example, but if you get everything from everywhere else and you don't build anything yourself, you will not appreciate things. You will become unappreciative. Turn to Zephaniah chapter 1. You will become unappreciative and apathetic. You will begin to not care. You will just have all these luxury things. You will think it's normal. You will just think that people owe you things. This is what you will become as a nation and as a person. It will happen to you. Zephaniah chapter 1. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says this. I mean, look, at Zephaniah is another prophet during the fall of Judah. And look at what he says here. This is just spot on on what will happen to you if you receive blessings from elsewhere and you appreciate nothing. In verse number 12 it says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with their candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees that say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. It's like, ah, they're just apathetic. God's not going to do anything. 
He's not going to, he's, is he even here? God's dead. God's not involved in this. God's not going to get involved. You know, I mean, these are the people that are saying, peace, peace, when war's coming. He's like, you know, they're doing all these wicked things, and they're about to be judged, and like, God, ah. He's not even paying attention, is what they're saying here. But he is paying attention. And judgment is coming. That's the point of the prophets. To come and just to speak against people like this, saying, hey, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. No, 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 not, not, not peace. Not peace. War is coming. But these people are like, God, God will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their good shall become booty. And their house is the desolation, and they shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The Bible says here is like all their stuff, all these, these things that, they, that bless them and turn them into this, they're going to be booty for somebody else. They're going to be spoils. People are going to take them all away. They're just kind of like, meh, God's neither here nor there. These are, the, these are the people the prophets were speaking against right here. From complacency to apathy. Remember that? All your goods will become spoiled, the Bible is saying. It's not good, but look, if you build things, if you build things, if you're a nation that builds things, you appreciate those things. I mean, you know, we used to say when we were kids, like when we were kids, we used to say a car is really not, because what we hated was we like had all these junky cars. When, you know, I was in high school, we had a junky car and your friends had junky cars. And we work on our junky cars and we bolt stupid things to our junky cars to try to make them go faster. And we invent things to put on our cars that don't cost any money. What we hated was the kid whose parents just went and bought him like a new Camaro. Man, we hated that guy. And we'd be like, you know what, your car's not your own until you work on it. We would say, your car's not yours until you've modified it, spoiled kid. Because he's driving this new car and it's faster than all our cars and it's a better car than all our cars and our cars are never going to be as nice as this kid's car. But it's like, hey, you know, at least these were ours. We worked on these things. We made them our own. So it was the same kind of theory. Same theory. A nation that just gets everything from everywhere else. A person that just gets everything, it just, you become ruined. You don't, you don't appreciate those things. So all these blessings from afar became a snare to Tyre. They became a snare to Babylon. So we see that success is fragile. We see that God can use others to bless you, but it's dangerous. So we can conclude, turn to James chapter 1. We can conclude, in James chapter 1, we can conclude, look at James chapter 1 verse 17. The Bible says, James chapter 1 verse 17, the Bible says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Look, every blessing comes from the Lord. Don't ever forget that. And He uses a multitude of others to bless us. Other nations, other people, etc. I mean, personally, I mean, you know, you can be a blessing to, you know, your family, your children, your spouse. All these people can bless you as well. You say, you say this morning, you know, you say this is, none of this is a surprise. I know that all my blessings come from God, and I know that you know, God uses people to bless me, and I know that if my business is doing well, that it's from God, and that all these different things and these ideas, you know, they're just God's ways of blessing me. And I know that when you know, that person helped me here and recognized me for this, that you know, I know that that really came from God, and that's, that person was just being used by God um, to do that. You say, I know all this stuff. It's like, why are you even like, talking about this? Like, this is like Christianity 101 stuff. I mean, was anybody surprised by anything I've said so far? Were you surprised, brother? I'm just kidding. Now, the point is, I mean, this is pretty basic stuff. But, I mean, let me ask you this question. If this is so basic, if this is so 101, why does everyone take God's blessings and turn against him? If it's so basic, why does everyone get blessed in their life and turn against God? Why does everyone get puffed up and filled with pride and turn against the Lord? Why can't we, I mean, think of the king of Tyre, the worst example of this. I mean, he got so puffed up, he claimed to be God. I mean, he's like the extreme of the spectrum. You get puffed up with pride because you've gotten some blessings, you know, you're kind of moving in that direction, but the guy actually took it, you know, 
further than anybody except maybe Satan. You know, good job. <laughs> Who wants that award? Nobody. But look, why do we let these things fill us with pride and turn us against the Lord? Why do we do it? Why can't we take a blessing? Why can't you take a blessing and thank God for it, enjoy it, and glorify the Lord for it? I mean, why, why is that so difficult for us to do? I mean, why can't, here's another, why can't we bless other people with our blessings? I mean, that's a great methodology, by the way. That's a great methodology. As soon as you get blessed, just bless somebody else. Just be like, it's like a hot potato. <laughs> I mean, that's a great methodology. Just write that one down and just do that. That will help you not get puffed up and not get prideful. You receive, I mean, my wife got our, our coffee paid for this morning on a small, small thing. Somebody just paid for her coffee, the car ahead of her, and then she just like paid for the people behind us. I don't know what the point of that is, but that's what happened. I mean, it was like somebody paid for $20 worth of coffee for us and it only cost us $4. So we came out of that one ahead, you know. So my whole day is made because of that. No, I'm just kidding. But I mean, when you receive a blessing, bless others immediately. That's just a great little methodology to just try to keep yourself down a little bit in your life. Why do we become puffed up? I'm going to tell you why. This is where, you know, maybe you'll learn something new. Here's why people get puffed up. When they get, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes, I mean, talk about a book that is exactly what we're talking about, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Why do we get puffed up? Why can't we take a blessing the right way? Why can't we as people take a blessing, thank God for it, uh, praise God for it, be appreciative of it? Why is it like three days later that we've already forgotten about it? Or, you know, it's three or four days later or a week later and we're just like, man, I, I, I'm awesome. I mean, here's the thing. You know, the reason that I got that blessing is because I'm great. Why are we like that? And don't tell me that you're not like that. Because everybody has that thought at least trying to come in through their fleshly, you know, self. Okay, so look, it happened to Solomon. It happened to Solomon. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And here's the first reason that this will happen to you. And the first reason is this, is people will praise you when you're up. People will praise you when you're up. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 9. I mean, there's a lot we could read in Ecclesiastes, but the Bible says in verse number 9, it says, So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. You ever get into that competition with somebody you didn't know? Like, oh yeah, you know, you know, maybe you graduated with a bunch of people or you, know, you went to school with a bunch of people and you're comparing on Facebook who's more successful in their life. And you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, well look at this picture of steak. And look at this picture of this, I just ate this. Look where I, I'm, look where I am, you know? All this kind of stuff. You're just competing with people. I mean, Solomon won. Solomon won. He won the competition that we could never win. He won the competition. He's like, I was the greatest. I increased more than all that were before me. People came from all over the world to tell him how great he was. Right. And, and, and not only that, but he, they had, he, he had something that you, you'll probably never have, but people were just giving him stuff. You're so great. Here's all a bunch of gold. You know, we're not, you know <laughs> hopefully that's never happened to me, okay? But... I mean, people are just giving Solomon all this gold. And this is probably never going to happen to you either. But look, people are going to praise you when you're up. They're going to tell you how great you are. You get in a position of power somewhere at work or whatever, you're going to have all kinds of people that just start treating you really nice for, I mean, no reason. It's going to be weird. They're just going to be super nice to you. They're all going to want to be your friend. I mean, this is what happened to Solomon. They're going to flatter you. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. They're going to flatter you. They're going to tell you you're great, when maybe they don't even think you're great. But they're going to tell you all these things. And look, this is where the snare is set. This is where the snare begins. Because look, not only will that, not only will that kind of treatment by other people destroy your appreciation from God, because it, what they're doing is they're telling you you're great. I was great, Solomon said. I was great. I mean, you compare Solomon to somebody else that we're going to look at in a few minutes. But look at Proverbs chapter 29 and verse number 5. This is why the Bible says this in Proverbs. It says, A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. And as all these people are nice to you and telling you how great you are, you're just walking right into that net. You're walking into a trap. 
and your pride is getting puffed up and your appreciation for God is being, is being lowered. And you're walking into that trap. That's why in Proverbs 16 and 18, you're not to turn there. It says, pride goeth before destruction. I mean, the flatterer and the setting of the net, that's just one means of that destruction. But you're going to walk into that, and it says, in haughty spirit before a fall. So the pride is going to blind you. The pride that you get from people telling you things is going to blind you, and you're going to walk into traps, and you're going to get caught by those traps. That net is going to get you. And you're going to appreciate, you know, and then, you know, God may get to the point where he actually destroys you. And that, you know, blessings come and blessings go. Now look, there's somebody that was very good at not letting this happen to him. Turn to Daniel chapter 2. The best example, hands down, in the Bible of somebody that was extremely successful, that gave every single credit to the Lord, is Daniel, for sure. Look at Daniel chapter 2. And look at verse number 26. He was very good. And you know what? He was very good at deflecting this. So look at what he always does. When people are telling him how great he is and people want to praise him, he stops it right away. He always stops it right away. Look at Daniel chapter 2 and verse 26. The Bible says, of course, the king is looking. He has a dream. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And he doesn't know what it means. He's like, you know what? Nobody knows what it means. And he goes and he brings all the wise men, and they're like, okay, we'll interpret the dream. Tell us what it is. You know? And he's like, you know, um, he's like, no, you know, tell me what the dream is first and then interpret it. And they're like, oh, we're fraudsters. We can't do that. Who, nobody can do that. And so he says, I'm going to kill, I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to kill all the wise men. And Daniel and his buddies, they're part of that. So Daniel, the Lord reveals the dream to Daniel. And look at verse 26. And the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and he said, The secret which the king hath demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a... He says, he says they can't. He's like, they can't do it. The decree for their death has already happened. He said, but... He says, look, the king is saying... Look, at this point, Daniel already knows the dream. Daniel already knows what the answer is right now. He has the answer that the king wants in his mind. God has already shown it to him when he's speaking right now. And he says, and the king says, can you show me? This is what happens. Can you show me the dream? Daniel could have just said yes and then told him. But what did Daniel say? He says, look, he's like, nobody can tell you this dream. He's saying, none of your wise men can tell you this dream. But, verse 28, there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of, of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into my mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. He's saying it's not coming from me. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living. He's like, look, it was not revealed to me because I'm great. He's like, God told me the dream. God is going to reveal the dream to you. And it's not because I'm great. So he even, he even brings himself down to the king. But for their sakes, there shall be made known the interpretation to the king that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Daniel already knew the answer at this point. He could have taken credit just by saying nothing. He could have just said nothing. The king could have said, do you know the dream? And he could have just told him the dream. He could have said nothing. But instead, he tells him, God revealed the dream. And God reveals secrets. And no wise man can do this. So always remember... With blessings, you are the recipient, not the source. You are the recipient of blessings. So look, and another thing is what is the, what is the last thing that Daniel does here? Turn to Daniel chapter 2 and ver look at verse number 49. The king made, look at verse 48. What happens to Daniel here? What happens to Daniel? Daniel receives a great blessing here. A great actual blessing. We're talking about a man that became second in command of two empires. Of two worldwide empires. In verse 48, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many gifts, great gifts, 
and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then the next thing he does... Daniel requested the king, he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. He blesses his friends right away. He takes his blessing, just blesses his friends. Just like that. So look, the conclusion is this. I mean, look, even secular, secular philosophy has said that there is no self-made men. You can read, you can read secular philosophers, secular books, secular thinkers that will tell you there's no self-made men. There's no, I mean, we love to, to hear stories about somebody that came from, from nothing and became some big, powerful person because that tells us that, hey, anybody can do it through hard work. And, I mean, these are great secular stories that people like to, to read. I mean, these, these, these rags to riches stories. But even the secular people know that there is no self-made men. Along the way, somebody agreed. Somebody gave them a job. Somebody blessed them in some way. Everybody could have ignored them. Everybody could have been against them, and you would have gotten nowhere. There is no such thing as a self-made man, even in secular philosophy. But to the Christian, we must recognize that every good gift comes from above. Everyone had... God used someone to give them a leg up, give them a break along the way. And anyone who gets prideful from blessings, I mean, is a fool. Yet, people do it all the time. Anybody that gets prideful from blessings, I mean, they will ultimately end in destruction. I mean, it's a travesty. It's a travesty. Tyre is an extreme example of this travesty. Not only were they blessed but they used their blessings to be evil and oppressive. So not only did they, they have great blessings, but they used those, and they, and they didn't appreciate God for it, but they took it steps further, and they used it to oppress people. They used it to, you know, do evil to people. And God, I mean, God's not going to let that go. If you get prideful from blessings, Christian, I mean, God is not going to let that go. I mean, that is not going to go unanswered. I mean, think about a father. I mean, this is exactly how God looks at us. Think about a father who thinks his children aren't appreciating things. What is your reaction, if you're a good father, to that situation? The perfect father is going to punish those situations, is going to realize that, you know what, I've spoiled these children. I've spoiled these children to the point where I am ruining them. If God is pouring blessings on your life and you're not appreciating them, but you're using them to build yourself up with pride, God is going to realize that He's ruining you with blessings and He's going to, he's, he's going to go the other way. For sure. And things are going to get ugly depending on how far you take it, depending on how hard you are to teach. God destroyed Tyre. So look, stay humble in your success because you, know, you may not always be successful. <laughs> I mean, it's a, great, it's a great test of character to see someone who is successful and who can receive blessings because the flesh wants to get puffed up. The flesh wants to look down on others. The flesh wants to say, you know, brother, I, I don't know, you know why you just can't get it together like me. I don't know why you're not so successful like me. It's a great testimony of character to someone who is handling success with humility. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're going to have good character, unfortunately. That's what comes with, you know, salvation by, through faith alone. Be a blessing to others in your success. That's the first thing Daniel did. He immediately saves his friends. You know, you didn't make you. Just remember that. God uses others to bless you. Pay that forward. This has applications for soul winning as well, by the way. I mean, this is soul winning. This is soul winning. You think you deserved salvation? You think you deserve, look, you deserve to go to hell. You think you deserve salvation? Yet somebody, somebody preached the gospel to you. Somebody took the time to be that blessing to you. Somebody took the time to open a Bible and explain 
the gospel to you. I mean, why in the world? I, I got mine. I'm saved. Yeah, you are. I'm saved. I got mine. Look at all these unsaved people out here. <laughs> You see all these, all these, all these people, these wicked people. I mean, I mean that's true in a lot of cases. But I mean, can that turn us in? I mean, can that make your heart turn a certain way? I mean, the prideful, the prideful saved Christian will lose the heart for the lost, and what a tragedy that would be. I mean, God blessed you with salvation. Somebody, God, God had somebody walk to you and tell you the truth and take the time to tell you the truth, I mean, don't just hang on to that and keep it for yourself. I mean, it is a person of great character that goes out and says, you know what, I, I mean, has been saved for 10 years, 15 years, that knows that there's nothing they can do to not be saved, that will go out and say, you know what, I didn't deserve this, and the least I can do is show somebody else. The least I can do is actually, and I, look, I didn't even come up with that idea. The least I can do is just listen to what the Bible says and go show somebody else yeah, and, and pass that blessing on. I mean, that's the model of how this world is supposed to get saved. Right. By passing that blessing of salvation on to others, by telling people the truth. Because people don't know, and some people want to know. Not everybody wants to know, but some people want to know. We will find people today that want to know. And we'll tell them. So look, it's a basic message this morning. But it's a huge problem. It's a basic message, but a big problem. You know, hey, all your blessings come from God. Tell me something I don't know. Well then why does everyone ruin their lives because of blessings? That's why Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books. It's just a great example of a guy that did it wrong and he's trying to help other people not do it wrong. It's God's Word trying to help us, remind us. That's why you see so many things repeated in the Bible. Because God's trying to help us. Hey, I know the flesh, and I know how you are, and I know, you know your sinful nature. Be warned of these things. So appreciate your blessings. Don't use them against the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.